So if there are no questions, I guess we'll just get going with today's material. I, I will say I think that today's lecture is probably the most theoretically challenging one of my half of the class. So what I want to do with this lecture is go through some of the ways we work with high-throughput data, especially high-throughput expression data, to try to put together network models. So basically how you would figure out how a large set of components are linked together into a regulatory network. And I tend to think this is a, a good thing to look at, a good topic, because it helps us understand a lot of important issues if we're going to be working with computational and systems biology. So in part, of course, it's relevant if we want to understand biological networks. So biological networks are often inferred from these kinds of complicated data sets. And knowing how this is done helps us understand a bit about how we interpret them, so what kinds of abstractions and simplifications they tend to contain, and why they contain them, as well as what kinds of mistakes may be made in inferring them. But it's also, I think, a nice example of a broader class of inference problem that is important to a lot of what's going on in biology today, as well as many other application areas. So essentially, it's a good model for a generic kind of problem where we're trying to infer a mathematical model or a computational model of a complicated system from a big, noisy data set. That tends to, I think, make it a good example of something that will illustrate principles that are relevant to a lot of other problems. In particular, it's a nice example of a kind of problem that's often tackled by methods from machine learning, so a discipline in computer science I've mentioned a few times before, that's become very important to modern biology because so much of biology is about making exactly these kinds of inferences from complex data sets. In addition, I think it's just a good way to think about issues in abstraction. So basically, what kinds of assumptions we make in a model and why we make them that are central to how computational people think about solving a problem. So I think if you can understand that in this context, you understand a lot of how people would go about thinking about many other kinds of problems in biology and in computational biology especially. And because of this, I think it's a good uh, one to try to work through, a good problem area to try to think about and try to get your head around how this particular problem is solved. So all of that is basically motivation for what we're going to be looking at today. And one of the first things we need to do if we actually get into looking at that is start talking about our assumptions. So when we're solving any kind of computational problem, so trying to make some inference from real data, through a computational algorithm, you have to think about your abstractions. You have to think about what assumptions you're making about your system, and that often comes down to assumptions we're making about our input and assumptions we're making about our output. So one of the sets of assumptions we'll be making about our outputs is that we are specifically trying to infer regulatory networks, and I'll be focusing on transcriptional regulatory networks, although similar principles apply to other kinds. And we're going to make some assumptions that are not necessarily strictly true about these networks, but are necessary to the kinds of algorithms we're working on. So in particular, I'm going to assume that we're looking at networks where we will have directed interactions, but we're going to exclude the possibility of cycles in our networks. And cycles just means any way of following a set of directed edges from one node back to that same node. So we have a cycle here where Lambda repressor regulates pro, and pro regulates lambda repressor. I'm going to say we're just not going to allow that. Even though that really happens, we're not going to be able to discover it. It's kind of a limitation of the methods that we can only tell that there is regulation here. We're not going to be able to tell that it's a bi-directional regulation. Likewise, we have no way of discovering that lambda repressor regulates itself or pro regulates itself. So what we'll end up finding is something like this. In principle, we would be able to figure out that there is regulation between lambda repressor and pro, and from pro to various downstream genes, but we have to make some assumptions to be able to find that. In terms of the data we'll be working with, we also have to have assumptions about our input. For the most part today, I'm going to be assuming that our input is gene expression data. So we'll see a bit later how to bring other kinds of data into it. But for the most part, I'm going to assume that we're looking at a data set where we have some set of genes, or um, it doesn't necessarily have to be genes exactly, but some set of probes on which we're profiling expression, and some set of conditions. We're going to assume, for the most part, that that's the data from which we're going to be trying to learn our model. 
have any questions on this yet? All right, so that basically is the problem we're going to solve. And I want to kind of walk through it a bit slowly to give you an idea of the ideas that go into solving this. And I think it helps to start by just talking about the intuition. So taking a very simplified version of the problem and kind of talking informally about the ideas that go into trying to solve this. So let's suppose for the moment that we are looking at just five conditions and four genes. So this would be a pattern of expression values. And here I'm basically turning it into a binary input. We're assuming a gene is either on, which is represented by magenta here, or it's off, which is represented by green. So we would have a pattern, for example, that gene 1 is on in condition 1, off in condition 2, on in 3, off in 4, on in 5, and so forth. And that would be a simplified version of what expression data might look like it for a few genes and a few conditions. And we can use that to illustrate the ideas behind how we would figure out that genes are under common regulation. And the basic idea we can get by just looking at the first two genes here, and you might observe if you look at the patterns of expression of those two genes, that they have, in this case, an identical pattern of expression. When gene 1 is on, gene 2 is on, and vice versa. When gene 1 is off, gene 2 is off, and vice versa. And that's basically the kind of thing you would look for to tell us that these genes are probably under common regulation. So it may be telling us that gene 1 is a positive regulator of gene 2. So if gene 1 were a positive regulator of gene 2, we would expect to see this pattern of correlated expression because when something causes gene 1 to turn on, it will turn gene 2 on. When something causes gene 1 to turn off, it will stop driving gene 2, so that would turn off. And you would see this pattern of correlation. It's worth noting that you would also see the same pattern if the regulation ran in the opposite direction. So if gene 2 were a positive regulator of gene 1, we would see the same kind of correlation here. And we'd see the same thing if both of them were regulated by some common third gene that we maybe aren't seeing here. So we don't know exactly what's going on just from that correlation, but at least gives us hints that these two genes are involved in a common piece of regulation, so a common subset of a regulatory network at least. Does this make sense to everyone? All right, so we can also observe that gene 3 seems to have a behavior that is connected to the behaviors of genes 1 and 2. So can anyone tell me how would you describe the activity of gene 3 relative to gene 1, let's say? Yeah, so that they have opposite patterns of expression. So gene 3 is anti-correlated with the expression of gene 1, and that would tell us that maybe gene 1 and 3 are under common regulation, but negative regulation. So it might be that gene 1 is a negative regulator of gene 3, and that would explain why when gene 1 is on, gene 3 is off, and when gene 1 is off, gene 3 is on. Could again be the opposite, so maybe gene 3 is a negative regulator of gene 1, and we could say similar things might be going on with gene 2. It could be that these three genes collectively are explained by gene 3 being a negative regulator of gene 1 and gene 2, or gene 1 being a positive regulator of gene 2, which is a negative regulator of gene 3, and so forth. So not every pattern of regulation is going to be consistent with this pattern of expression, but some patterns are and some patterns aren't going to be consistent with it. So we can make at least a partial inference of what's going on in this network. If we look at gene 4, we can see that there doesn't really seem to be any correlation between gene 4 and any of the others. So sometimes when one is on, 4 is on. Sometimes when one is off, 4 is on. Sometimes when one is on, 4 is off. Sometimes when one is off, 4 is off. So it looks like there's no correlation between 1 and 4, and likewise no correlation between 2 and 4 or 3 and 4. So we can say probably that's kind of sitting out separately from the other genes. But the idea behind how we put together these at least possible edges of regulation captures the key principle for this work, which is the correlated expression implies common regulation. And that's basically the intuition we're going to try to use to put together computer models that will allow us to select among possible regulatory networks based on the data we have available. So any questions about that? 
Okay, so that is giving us kind of an intuition, but there's still a lot of ambiguity there. So as I suggested, we can come up with some networks that are consistent with this data. So we can say that four is sitting out by its own, and maybe one is a positive regulator of two, which is a negative regulator of three, or it could be three is a negative regulator of one and two, or one is a positive regulator of two, negative regulator of three. We don't have a, enough information just to go from this intuition to a unique specification of the correct model for this network. So we do need to do a bit more here. We need to move beyond the intuition. So this is kind of the idea, but we're actually going to write a computer program to do this. We need to be a bit more precise about what we're trying to do. That ambiguity is one of the issues that will come up, and it's not the only one we need to deal with. We do have to deal with the fact that there may be lots of models consistent with the data, and especially when we're using a very informal specification of how we're detecting regulation, it's very hard to decide between the possible models that might be consistent with the, these data, and we need to be more precise about what we're doing if we're going to have a better chance of doing that. We also have to deal with the fact that real data is not as clean as that toy example I was just showing you. So if we have a real data set like this one, then you can observe that there are some genes that maybe look like they're nicely correlated. So if we pick maybe two genes, let's say here and just below it here, those look like they have very similar patterns of expression across the samples, but they don't have exactly the same pattern. And we need ways of judging whether that's strong enough evidence, whether they're close enough that we actually think they're under common regulation. Likewise, we can pick maybe a gene here and a gene here and get a pattern that looks anti-correlated. But again, it's not perfect. They both have low expression in this region. It's not obvious that that would be strong enough evidence to say they're really anti-correlated. When we get more precise and more quantitative with these things, we also have to pay a lot of attention to matching our universe of possible models to the data we have available. So when we're talking about inferring these kinds of regulatory networks, we're considering among a set of possible ways of joining our genes. So if we have n different genes we're considering, where m might be 20,000 or so for a human genome expression data set, then we have to consider that the set of models we're choosing among is going to be more or less the set of sign-directed graphs among 20,000 <coughs> genes. And the number of ways of putting together graphs or networks of 20,000 nodes is going to be a very large number. It's roughly on the order of, let's say, 3 to the m squared over 2 if they have n genes. And if m is 20,000, this is a very large number. And that matters because we have to consider whether our data gives us enough information to decide between these. To a first approximation, you can figure out if your data is sufficient to decide among possible models if it has at a number of data points that's roughly on the order of the log of the number of models, or at least that high. So that's more or less how many pieces of information you need to decide between your models. Our number of data points would be our number of genes times our number of samples. The number of genes is something on the order of 20,000. The number of samples would probably be something on the order of 100. So can anyone tell me which is bigger, the log of this number, 3 to the m squared over 2, or this number, m times n? Well, the logarithm of an exponent, you more or less get, it's a constant times the thing in the exponent. So this would be proportional to m squared over 2. M is about 20,000, so M squared over 2 would be about 200 million. M times N is 20,000 times 100, so that would be about 2 million. So we're comparing about 200 million to about 2 million. The set of models is much too large to be decided among by this set of data. So that's the kind of intuition that goes into these kinds of problems. And part of why it's often very important to think about your abstractions. You need to be able to choose from a set of models that is in principle learnable. And so it's in principle decidable among these models from the data you have available. And there is a bit of a mismatch here. So we need some more advanced thinking about this. We're going to bring down the set of models to something we can handle.
One other thing we often need to worry about when we are looking at this kind of problem is more precisely specifying inputs and outputs. So I talked at a high level about what our inputs are. So our inputs are expression data. Our outputs are networks we're trying to infer. And I'm going to simplify a bit more and basically go to this model where we're just assuming we have binary data, like in that toy example. So the real data, we would have quantitative measures of expression of different genes. We're just going to assume it's on or off. So on is 1, off is 0. These are color-coded magenta for on, green for off. So we're going to assume for the moment that our data is a set of genes that are either on or off in a set of conditions. And we're going to assume, again, that we're trying to infer these models. And we'll maybe try to simplify the problem a bit, move to an even simpler class of models by dropping the assumption that we're trying to learn signs of the network. So often, that's the kind of simplification we would have to make. We might need to say we have too complicated a set of models to learn among possible sign networks. So we will pick among models that just say which genes are regulating which other genes and not worry about whether it's positive or negative regulation. Even that may be a bit too much for us, but we'll make that assumption for the moment. And that then lets us start getting more precise about what we're trying to do here. So to get even further to the point where we can actually start quantitatively talking about this, I'll actually take it an even further step of simplification for the moment and say, let's imagine we're looking at a data set with just two genes in it. Later, we'll back off from some of these assumptions. You have to generalize to more genes. But let's just say we're looking at a data set where we have two genes, gene 1 and gene 2, profiled in eight different conditions. And this is, for the moment, what we'll be working with to try to decide what models are supported by our data. Now, if we're assuming just two genes, then what we're trying to find are networks among two genes. And by simplifying it that much, we can make our universe of possible networks pretty small. There are only three possible networks of two genes for the level of abstraction we're looking at. Either we have model one, gene one regulates gene two, which is represented by a graph where we have nodes one and two and an edge from one to two. Or we have model two, gene two regulates gene one. Or we have model three, gene one and gene two are independent, so neither regulates the other. And our correct model for this data set is going to be one of these three models. And our problem then is to figure out which of these three models is most consistent with our data. So is the task clear to everyone? Any questions at this point? OK, so we are looking at these three possible models. And what we want to do is come up with a precise quantitative way of saying how good is each of these models in terms of this set of data. And the way we would do this is using a concept we've, we've seen a couple of times previously in this class. And that is the concept of a likelihood. So when we're working with these complex, noisy data sets, we usually want to talk about the language of probability. And in particular, we want to talk about the probability of the data being consistent with the model. And we usually phrase that in terms of a likelihood function. So we will call our model a variable m. That's the network we're trying to infer. We'll call our data d. That's the expression data we get to look at. And what we're trying to do is evaluate our models based on the probability of the data being produced by the model, which we would refer to as likelihood of d given m. So does anyone remember where we've seen this concept of likelihoods before? sequence analysis. This came up a few places. For example, position-specific scoring matrices for, let's say, detecting program <coughs> domain. That is an example of the domain. So there, the sequence is the data. The domain um, is the model. And you're trying to figure out whether a particular model, so a particular domain, is more consistent with your data than a different one. We're basically trying to do the same thing here. We're going to run through a set of possible models and ask for each of them how likely is it we would see the pattern of expression we've actually seen under that model. And then the model that has the maximum likelihood is going to be the one we would say is most consistent with our data. Is that clear to everyone? 
Okay, so let's see how that would work. And we'll actually take even a further step backward for the moment and say we will try to evaluate likelihood for just a single gene. So let's say we're looking at just gene one and we've got a pattern of expression across a set of conditions. What we're going to assume is that there is some probability function that produces expression values. So expressions we will assume are generated by a random variable. In this case, they're binary, so this would be a very simple variable called a, a, a Bernoulli or indicator variable. Basically, it's like flipping a coin, but a, a biased coin. So sometimes the gene is on, sometimes it's off. And then we could talk about the likelihood of a string of expression values across conditions by simply multiplying what the likelihoods of the individual expression values. So if we're assuming we're looking at a gene that is unregulated by anything else, then there is some probability that gene is on and some probability it's off. And the probability of this string of values across conditions is simply the probability of the product of the probabilities of the individual values. So the probability of seeing 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0 is the probability of seeing 1 times the probability of seeing 1 times the probability of seeing 0 times the probability of seeing 0 and so forth. So that's how we're going to evaluate the likelihood of an unregulated gene's pattern of expression. So is that clear to everyone? All right, so to do that and turn this into a precise quantitative value, we need a way of its assigning probabilities to these individual expression values. And the easiest way to do that if we are talking about simply a binary value like this is to figure out how often it is in one of these states versus the other and say that that's our estimate of the probability of being in that state. So five times out of the eight we've observed, we see a one. Three times out of the eight we've observed, we see a zero. And so we're going to declare that the probability of one, at least our best estimate of it, is five eighths. And the probability of zero is three eighths. So that's known as a maximum likelihood estimate. It's basically saying that our best estimate of how often that unregulated gene is 0 or 1 is simply the fraction of times we observe it being 0 or 1. So we get these estimates. Our probability of 1 is 5 eighths. Our probability of 0 is 3 eighths. And then we can talk about the probability of the complete string of expression <coughs> values across conditions being probability of 1, which is 5 eighths times the probability of 1, which is 5 eighths, times the probability of 0, which is 3 eighths, times the probability of 0, which is 3 eighths, and so forth, multiplying all of those through and getting to an actual number, 0.00503 in this case. So that is giving us a likelihood of generating this string of expression values, or at least our maximum likelihoods, or our best estimate based on the data we're going to see. And we could do that for any other string of values. You can come up with some specific number that tells you how likely we think it is that an unregulated gene would generate that string of values. So let me pause for a moment here. Uh, uh, everyone with me so far on this? Any questions at this point? Okay, so we now have the ability to assign an expression value to one gene. And we can use that to uh, assign a likelihood to one of our three models, so in particular what we call model three, the model that the genes are, are, are unregulated, so neither of them regulates the other. We know how to assign a likelihood to a string of values for one unregulated gene. And if we're assuming these genes are independent of one another, then the likelihood of the pair of values for the two genes is simply the product of their individual likelihoods. These will actually end up being the same number in this case because we have the same number of ones and zeros for each gene. And we take that product, it comes out to about 2.5 times 10 to the minus fifth. So we can get a likelihood score for this model. Any questions about that? All right, so things get a little trickier when we move to a model that has regulation. And we need to bring in another concept from probability, and that's the notion of conditional probability. So if we're declaring that gene 1 regulates gene 2, then we're saying that gene 1's values are unregulated. We know how to evaluate the likelihood for an unregulated gene. But gene 2's values are conditional on gene 1's. So we're assuming when gene 1 is on, that gene 2 will have some propensity for being on and off. 
And when gene one is off, gene two will have a different propensity for being on and off. So that's the idea of a conditional probability. And we would write this using that bar notation we'd seen in the likelihoods to say that, for example, if we want to evaluate the probability of this string of expression values for gene two, given that we've observed this string for gene one, we would need to talk about conditional probabilities of each value of gene two, given each value of gene one. So if we want to talk about the probability of gene two being zero, given that gene one is one, that's what we would need to figure out the contribution to the likelihood of this first value for gene two, because we observe that gene two is zero, it's occurring simultaneously with gene one being one, and the way we would evaluate that is to say that our best estimate would be derived by looking at how often gene two is one and looking at what fraction of those make gene two zero. So we can observe that five out of eight times gene one is one, and of those five, one out of the five makes gene two zero. So we would say that informally, gene two tends to be turned off when gene one is on, but more formally, its probability, the probability of gene two being off, given that gene one is on, we would estimate at one fifth. Does that make sense to everyone? So if the conditional probability of gene two being zero, given that gene one is one, is one fifth, then the probability of gene two being one, given that gene one is one, has to be four fifths. So of the five times that gene one is one, gene two is one four of those five times. So this is four fifths. And the same logic applies for figuring out the conditional probability of gene two taking on zero or one, given that gene one takes on zero. We can see that there are three conditions in which gene one is zero. In two out of those three, gene two is zero. In one out of those three, gene two is one. So the conditional probability gene two is zero, given gene one is zero, is two thirds. And the conditional probability gene two is one, given gene one is zero, is one third. So we now have all the probabilities we would need to figure out the likelihood of this string of expression values for gene two, given this string of expression values for gene one. And we can just plug in there and say that the likelihood of this model, where we have gene one regulated by gene two, is given by the probability of gene one on itself producing this string of expression values, which we already figured out was 0.0503, and the probability of gene two producing this string of expression values given that gene one has produced this string of values. And we just saw how to figure out each contribution here. We have to get the probability gene two is zero, given gene one is one. The probability gene two is one, given gene one is one. The probability gene two is zero, given gene one is zero. And so forth, running through those conditional probabilities. And the product of those would get us then a likelihood for this model where gene one regulates gene any questions about any of that? All right, so we've now gotten to the point that we can assign likelihood numbers, so actual values, to two of our models. And the third model is pretty easy once we know how to do this one. It's basically the same thing. We just flip the edge, and then we're talking about the likelihood of this model, the data for this model being the likelihood of gene two, just having that expression vector on its own, and the likelihood of gene one having this expression vector, given that gene two has this expression vector. And we would do the same kind of inference. We need to know the probability gene one is one, given gene two is zero, probability gene one is one, given gene two is one, and so forth. And we can put all of that together, get a product of likelihood values, and we can observe this is actually going to come out to the same value we just saw for the model with the regulation in the opposite direction. It's not a coincidence that those numbers end up the same here. The way we post the problem will actually guarantee that you'll get the same likelihood for either direction of regulation here. But basically, this is giving us a way of evaluating that model. So we now have likelihood scores, so actual numbers we can assign to the likelihood of that data set for each of these three models. So on the basis of this, we can make some conclusions about what models are supported by the data. And we can say that, at least for the abstraction we're considering now, the data definitively says that 
these two models, where one regulates two or two regulates one, have a higher likelihood than this model, so unregulated. So we can say that at least for this abstraction, the data is more consistent with the assumption that these genes are under common regulation than that they are unrelated, although we can't distinguish between the directions of regulation. Those two have the same likelihood, so we are unable to decide between those two models for this kind of data. Any questions about that? Yeah. Um, so the probabilities are going to be based on the conditions also. So how do you know whether the conditions that you make are like are appropriate? Uh, yeah, so the choice of conditions is going to affect what you're able to learn here, and it is an assumption of the model that we're kind of pretending the different conditions are independent random samples from a given probability distribution, and that's really not necessarily going to be true. Depending on how you set the conditions, you may not be seeing some patterns of expression because they happen not to change in those conditions, or you may be biasing it towards certain patterns of expression. So that will matter, and in general, you're going to want to pick your conditions such that they're going to be changing the patterns of expression for the gene regulatory networks you care about. But you can never be guaranteed that you're seeing everything. There might be some correlations you're not seeing because you just didn't look at the right conditions. Um, for the regulatory ones, when will, will the probabilities ever be different? Uh, well, for the regulatory ones, in this case, if we're trying to learn this just from expression data, they'll actually always be the same for regulation pointing in one direction versus another. So the conditional probabilities are always going to come out identical because you, you can't tell. You can tell that there's a correlation. You can tell how strong it is. But you can't tell whether it's correlated because the regulation goes this way or this way. So we will see a bit later in the lecture, but essentially you need to bring in other kinds of data if you want to be able to decide between these two possibilities. Any other questions? Uh, yeah. Okay. okay, well I guess if you get to this point of the model, it's actually pretty easy to generalize to more complicated models. So if you've understood things up to now, it's not really any more difficult to go to a network of four genes or a network of 100 genes or 1,000 genes. So we can say maybe we are considering this pattern of expression values for four genes, and we want to evaluate the likelihood of this possible network among those four genes. It's actually basically the same kind of reasoning you would use for two genes. We're saying one is not regulated by anything, so we would evaluate the likelihood of the expression vector for one using the logic we've seen before. We're saying two is regulated by one, so we would need to consider the conditional probability of the expression vector for gene two, given that we get to observe the expression vector for gene one. We might have a gene that has multiple regulators, but that's a pretty straightforward generalization. We would need to consider the expression vector for gene three and ask what the likelihood of that is given that we get to observe both gene one and gene two and assume that the regulators are three. But that's basically the same kind of thing. We want to know the likelihood of this first data point. We're asking what is the probability gene three takes on zero given that gene one is one and gene two is zero. And then what we could say is we'll look for the fraction of all of the conditions in which gene one is one and gene two is zero. We can observe that among those conditions is actually only one condition where, the, where that is occurring. And so we can say of that one condition, one example has gene three zero. So the conditional probability of gene three being zero given that gene one is one and gene two is zero would just be one, or at least that would be our best estimate from this data set. So basically it's the same thing as working with condition uh, conditioning on a single area. And of course, with gene four, we're just saying that's conditioned on three. So we would say we would ask the likelihood of gene four's expression vector, given that we get to observe gene three's expression vector. So pretty much, it's just multiplying through a larger number of values. But it's the same kind of operation we would do if we just had two genes in our network. And although it might get tedious to do this by hand, once you write a computer program, it's the same computer program for 
four genes or a hundred genes or whatever to at least evaluate this likelihood for a given network. It's pretty straightforward to do. So that makes sense to everyone. All right, so there are complications that come in in actually solving this in the real world, though. And I want to start backing away from our simple version of the problem and talk about some of these complications. One of them is that if you really want this thing to work well, you're probably not going to be able to get good answers just from raw expression data. And one of the big ways you get these things to work is to bring in what's called prior knowledge. So prior knowledge literally means anything you knew about the solution before you started looking at your data. And very often in biological contexts, we have quite a lot of prior knowledge. There may be databases of existing networks we can look at that will tell us that some of the genes interact with one another. We may have some general expectations that most genes don't regulate most other genes, so we can build in a kind of prior bias against regulation unless there's strong evidence in favor of it. And all of this is relatively easy to incorporate into these kinds of models, what we call Bayesian graphical models. Basically, if we are assuming that we have some likelihood of the data given the model to bring in this prior knowledge, you can pretty much just multiply the likelihood of the data given the model times your prior expectation of how good that model is. So if we have a database that tells us that gene one regulates gene two, we would want to decide how much confidence to put in that. Maybe we are 90% confident that the database is right. So we would then multiply a model that has that interaction by 0.9, 90%, to weight that model to favor the information we already had. If we were considering a model that was missing that interaction that our database said was there, then we would multiply it by 1 minus 0.9, so 0.1. And that is a way that we can, in a rigorous probabilistic sense, take our prior expectations and kind of build them in as biases into our model. So use this existing data to bias it towards models that are consistent with what we already believe is true. And that will tend to give you a much better uh, final outcome from these kinds of analyses than if you just try to do this directly from the data. The fact is we already know a lot and you want to use what you know if you want to get good results out of these things. There are also some generic sorts of prior probabilities we often bring into these models. So generally, these models have a problem known as overfitting. So overfitting means that you are going to infer a more complicated model than is actually correct because that model will tend to pick up on chance associations in the data you have in front of you that are not real things. It's just by random chance you see some correlations that aren't really supported by the the real biology. So usually you will put in what are called some anti-complexity priors, which basically means that you bias it against having edges uh, unless there's strong evidence for that edge. So we might say that if there is an edge that we have no evidence one way or another to favor, we might throw in a prior probability of 0.01 for that edge. So we say, it's unlikely that edge is there unless the data supports it. And a model that's missing an edge where there's no data, we throw in a prior probability of, let's say, 0.99. So we say that probably it is correct not to put in an edge if there's no data there. Probably it's incorrect to put in the edge. And what that will do is essentially bias the model against throwing in extra edges unless the data is really clearly supporting those edges. So that tends to be another thing we need to do to get these working. Any questions about that? We can also bring in other kinds of data, and that tends to be an important thing if we want to get these models right. So a model like the one I was telling you will always have that problem that you can't get directionality right in the edges. You can figure out that two genes are correlated, but it looks the same to have a pattern of correlation if gene one is regulating gene two versus gene two regulating gene one way of doing that would be to have binding site predictions. So maybe we have sequences of promoters of our genes, and we have PSSMs that tell us the binding propensities of particular transcription factors. So maybe we know gene one is a transcription factor. We look at other things it regulates. We build a position-specific scoring matrix. And then we can use that to say, 
what is the likelihood gene 2 would have that promoter if gene 2 were a target of gene 1. So we can get a likelihood score from that assignment, just like we can get a likelihood score from the expression data. Basically, we can evaluate the likelihood of the model, or the likelihood of the expression data given the model, just as we just saw, and we can evaluate the likelihood of the promoter sequence given the model using a PSSM or an HMM or some other kind of model like that. And another thing these Bayesian models are good for is that if we assume we have two independent uh, outputs, so two independent pieces of data that are reflecting what model is true, then you can simply multiply these together. And you can say that the likelihood of the expression data and the promoter sequences jointly is the likelihood of the expression data given the model times the likelihood of the promoter sequence given the model. So that tends to be something that these Bayesian models are very good for, bringing in these heterogeneous kinds of data sets. And usually in real practice, uh, you would not be trying to build this from one kind of data. You try to bring in whatever sort of data you have available to get more accurate and more complete models. Any questions about that? We can go an even further step backwards towards the real problem by also recognizing that we don't actually need that assumption of binary variables that I've been using to kind of illustrate things throughout the lecture. So in usual practice, we wouldn't turn our variables into just on and off. We have useful information in the relative level of expression. So it tells us something interesting if the expression level is high or medium or low. And there are ways of using that with more sophisticated probability. I'm not going to go into great depth about how this works here, so I have to compute these exact values here, but I think it is worth knowing that you can use these kinds of quantitative expression values you really get off of the arrays. At a high level, the way we would do this is sort of similar to what we were trying to do in figuring out the likelihoods of the on and off values. So looking at the data we have available and fitting a probability of being on or a probability of being off based on that data, we would just do it with a more, uh, more complicated kind of probability density. So we might say that we believe our data is described by Gaussian probability densities. So any particular gene we might imagine has more or less a Gaussian range of possible expression values. And then we would try to fit the parameters of this Gaussian to our data. So we try to figure out what's the mean expression, what's the standard deviation. And once we've done that, we can then go through the individual values and we can ask, what is the probability of observing an expression level of 1.5, or 0.4, or minus 0.3, or minus 1.2? We can see what that is relative to the Gaussian we've learned, and we can get actual quantitative numbers here. So we can get numbers that tell us the actual likelihoods of this range of quantitative values. And with more complex methods, we can also bring that into the analysis of regulated genes. So figure out what the likelihood is of a quantitative vector of expression, given that we get to observe another quantitative vector of expression that we assume is influencing this one. So there, again, I'm not going into great depth about how you do this, but I think it's worth being aware that in the real problem, you would want to work with the actual quantitative values, and this is something you can do. It's not of that hard to understand how you do that. Any questions about that? All right, so I have skipped over a very important part of how you would really do this in practice. So if you've understood what I've been talking about up to this point, you should know how to evaluate likelihoods for different models. So we can look at a data set, and we can run through a set of possible models for this data set. And you should all by this point understand how you can take any given model, compute a likelihood, and then look at the end at the likelihoods of all of the models you considered, and pick the model or models that have the best likelihood, what are called the maximum likelihood models. Usually, though, if you're looking at more than a few genes, it's not possible to run through every possible model. So if you're looking at two or three or maybe four or five genes, you can enumerate every possible network among those genes, compute the likelihoods just like I've described, and at the end, pick the, uh, the network or networks that have maximum likelihood. But you can't do that if you're looking at 100 genes or 20,000 
there are too many networks to choose from, and so you do need more sophisticated ways of doing that. That's something that gets into more advanced computer science and statistics than we can assume or cover in this class. So I just wanted to say at a high level, there's a lot more theory available to solve these problems. One way of doing this is to use optimization algorithms, which basically means ways of taking these hard problems and trying to find the one or a maximum likelihood network. So essentially, there, for this kind of problem, that you need a lot of more sophisticated theory to allow you to find the best network or something that's likely to be close to the best without having to try everything. So just be aware that there is a lot of theory behind this. This is the sort of thing where if you were taking more advanced computer science algorithms classes, then you would learn how to do that kind of problem, so how to pose and solve a problem like this. The main alternative to that is what's called a sampling method. And a sampling method is basically a way of running through the space of possible models and trying to figure out what the high quality models have in common. So with the sampling method, what you would try to do is figure out likelihoods for a significant fraction of your models, hopefully the ones that account for most of the likelihood. And then you would be able to, in principle, figure out that maybe there are some edges that are very strongly supported in all of your high likelihood models. And you can say you're really confident those edges are there. But you may find that there are other edges that are sometimes present in high likelihood models, sometimes not. And then you can say you're unsure whether or not those edges are there. That kind of confidence estimate is something people often worry about in working with these things in real practice. And that is a kind of analysis you'd also learn in a more advanced class. So that would be something typically you'd learn about in a more advanced statistics context. To a large degree, machine learning is kind of the intersection of computer science and statistics. So if you were taking a more advanced machine learning class, you'd be likely to learn a, a set of methods that sort of covers both of these possibilities and learn a bit more about which methods might be appropriate for particular problems and why you might favor one method over another for a, a single given system. So I, I know I'm not really telling you in, in any, at more than a very high level what these things are, but I just want you to be aware that we can only cover so much here. I want you to understand how this is done but you really do need more advanced training. And we can cover or assume here to actually implement one of these for a non-trivial example. Any questions about any of that? All right, so that kind of brings us to where network inference actually is in common practice today. So the methods I was trying to tell you about here really are basically how people would infer a network from expression data and also bring in other things like uh, binding site data, which may be experimental binding data, like the chip seek we learned about last time, or it may be computational predictions, like these PSSM models. So really, this is more or less the way people would use this. The kind of intuition I'm describing, these likelihood approaches, these different ways of deciding between them, really are how this is done in practice. But the practice is, of course, more complicated than in the toy examples I've been walking through today. Usually, you would want to bring in a lot of kinds of data sources. You want to bring in prior knowledge. You need some expertise to understand how to code your prior knowledge, which is often fairly informal, into the language of probability. And you need to know a fairly large amount of algorithmic theory or statistical theory if you want to be able to solve these effectively on the harder problem instances. So, any of you who know some basic programming could probably go and code off a relatively simple version of this that would work on maybe five or so genes, but you do need some more advanced algorithms to be able to solve this kind of thing and get a reasonable answer for 1,000 genes or 20,000 genes or whatever. I do hope some of you go on to more advanced computational biology, and one of the reasons I go through this is to kind of give you a hint about what more advanced computational biology than we covered here would look like. If you really are interested in these directions and want to know more, commonly these are things you would learn about from the computational perspective in a class on machine learning. If you're at Carnegie Mellon, you'd have a number of options for a machine learning class where you could learn about the theory of these methods, and you could learn about their application specifically to these kinds of genomics problems in a graduate level computational biology class, such as 
computational genomics, of which there are also a few variants uh, available here. And for those of you who go on elsewhere to graduate studies, these kinds of things are becoming very important in biological, uh, uh, basically biological research of any kind, so it's likely you have other options elsewhere to learn about these similar sorts of topics. So we're out of time for today. Are there any last questions before we break for the day? Okay, and on Friday what we're going to do is move away from the theory to some of the more hands-on practice of how we can learn about what's already known about networks and pathways and how we can use some of the network and pathway resources in our analysis. So we'll see you all on Friday.